to Ireland, my own dear native land. It break my heart to see friends part, for it's then the tears of fall. I'm on my way to America, will I ever see home once more? For now I leave my own true love and Paddy's green shower of shore. Our ship she lies at anchor, she's standing by the quay. May fortune bright shine down each night as we sail over the sea. Many ships have been lost, many lives it cost on the journey that lies before. With a tear in my eye, I'm bidding goodbye to Paddy's green shower of shore. The green shamrock shore remembered in this song is, of course, that of Ireland whose people have influenced the society and music of America for over 200 years. The performers in this program are Irish and American. They and countless others are dedicated to continuing the centuries-old living tradition of Irish music. civilized long before the Roman Empire reached England. Ruled by warrior kings and chieftains, Ireland had common law and language. Poets and harpers became important figures because they set the history and law of Ireland to verse, accompanied with the music of the Irish harp. To this day, the harp is the symbol of Irish pride and the living tradition of ancient Ireland. McDonald's March is a traditional Irish tune, played here on a wire-strung Irish harp by Anne Heyman, accompanied by her husband, Charlie Heyman, on bazooki, an instrument similar to a mandolin. Irish people to Christianity and the later arrival of the conquering British changed Irish culture and music forever. By the end of the 16th century, the harpers, bards, and the society they preserved had all but disappeared from Ireland. music of course would have been lost I know that you have talked about the uh, the harpers the old itinerant harpers and the poets who roamed about Ireland and uh, Tullif O'Carolan of course was the best known of them and uh, way back in 1792 um, there was a gathering of harpers in Belfast paid for by uh, a doctor called Henry Joy, who would have been an uncle of the patriot Henry Joy McCracken. They collected over 2,000 tunes that have been attributed to old Carolyn, and that's not counting the ones that have been lost. But that, uh, that gathering of harpers certainly was a turning point in Irish music as well. Uh, they they uh, saved a lot of, say, the slow airs and indeed the reels and jigs and things that are prevalent now. Uh, and I, I know, of course, that many have been uh, uh, composed since that. But
but uh, very, very significant in that they saved a lot of, of the old uh, Celtic tradition of music. And I think we should be very grateful to Dr. Henry Joy and his partner for paying for that and uh, saving uh, such a huge wealth, a treasure actually, of our music for us. And hope the young people will continue to improve on it and play it and enjoy it as much as I have all these years. The British brutally suppressed the old Gaelic culture, but the persistently musical Irish took up European instruments like the accordion, mandolin, banjo, violin, flute, and whistle. Music and Gaelic verse composed on the harp and bagpipes was lost or rearranged for the new instruments and the English language. Even so, the efforts of those musicians preserved and sustained the living tradition for their descendants, who continue to enjoy and build from it. The Boys of Blue Hill play an Irish reel in a style that is characteristic of much of the music of Ireland after the British invasion. In the early 1800s, Ireland and countries in continental Europe suffered a blight of their potato crop, which reoccurred and spread with devastating effect in later years. From 1831 through 1856, parts of Ireland were rendered a desolate wasteland of dead and dying, fearfully known as the Devil's Field. Sketch artists from the Illustrated London News captured the suffering and despair of the Irish people in a series of articles published at the time. Continued religious persecution and the virtual collapse of Ireland's economy forced the emigration of over one million Irish Catholics to England, Europe, and America. Many Irish set sail for America and died in the crossing because they were transported in so-called coffin ships. With emigres crowded below decks under unsanitary conditions, these marginally seaworthy British ships often sailed during the worst Atlantic weather and were considered inadequate for the shipping of valuable commodities. is a father's lament to his son about fleeing the misery and oppression of famine-stricken Ireland. They say it is a pretty place wherein the prince might dwell. 
Then why did you abandon me? The reason to me tell. My east on my hills are her native land with energy and pride. Until I break them on the land and my sheep and cattle die. The rent and taxes were to pay and I could not redeem. And that's the cruel reason why I left so skibbly. Tis what I do remember, the year of 48. When I arose with air and spies to fight against the fate, I was hunted through death early by the Queen's penal law, and that's another reason why I left those skibbering. American seaports were overwhelmed by waves of emaciated and unskilled Irish immigrants seeking freedom in the New World. They were isolated in an ethnic subculture by prejudice, economy, and their own clannish behavior. In cities like New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, there were large concentrations of Irish who were related by old clan and tribal ties. New York City's Five Points District was well known as an Irish ghetto. Thousands of Irish Americans left inner city ghettos to join work gangs on the roads, rivers, canals, and railroads of the expanding western frontier. The work was hard, but they welcomed the promise of a better life and they took their families and music with them. Songs from the Irish living tradition became a major influence on traditional American styles, such as bluegrass, folk music, and dance. Soldier's Joy is a tune that's played both in Ireland and in the United States, in fact, all over the United States and Canada. Scotland, Sweden, and many other places. So here's the bare bones of the melody of Soldier's Joy. find a tune played something like this. States, you may find something like this happening to the tune. The historically martial Irish fought in the American Civil War as draftees and volunteers. 
They served heroically, driven by their desire to earn recognition and respect as patriotic Americans. The Fighting 69th of New York, the 9th Massachusetts, the 2nd Philadelphia, and the 19th and 23rd Illinois were among the fighting Irish units of the Corcoran Legion and were almost to a man Irish American. They were easily identified by the regimental colors and the Irish tunes they marched to. After the Civil War, the United States emerged as an industrial world power. A majority of Irish Americans became part of the new middle class. They earned more, worked less, and lived longer than ever before. The gay 90s had arrived, opening an era when Irish American musicians were making an indelible mark on American culture. Irish music continued to be played in Irish neighborhoods, and the tradition was sustained by the constant flow of new immigrants from Ireland. Captain Francis O'Neill of the Chicago Police Department seized upon the opportunity to preserve the traditional music. O'Neill sent officers to collect songs from musicians in the Irish neighborhoods. He gathered over 2,000 songs in the largest collection of Irish music ever published. Captain O'Neill also organized the Chicago Police Department Ilian Piper's Band. Vaudeville was a perfect vehicle for Irish American entertainers. The song, Blue Tail Fly, also known as Jimmy Crack Corn, was derived from an Irish hornpipe melody and a staple in many early minstrel routines. The old soft shoe style of dance is credited to an Irishman named Delaney, who used the stage name George Primrose. Two other Irish Americans, John T. Kennedy and Harry Kelly, are recognized as the first to adapt Irish step dancing to what we now call tap dancing. The vaudeville, comedy, and variety routines characterized by performers like Harrigan and Hart became popular attractions in theaters and dance halls across the U.S. Much of what is now considered to be pure Americana was created by Irish Americans. Perhaps the most memorable of them was George Michael Cohan, who authored patriotic standards such as Yankee Doodle Boy, Your Grand Old Flag, and ultimately Over There, for which he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Thank <laughs> you. 
With the availability of inexpensive phonograph players and recordings, music that had existed only as oral tradition became part of mass culture. The phonograph became the entertainment of choice and in many family parlors replaced singing and playing instruments. Record catalogs featured many Irish music and comedy titles. Irish Americans were bringing the living tradition to homes all across America. Heard here, a German immigrant named Kimmel made a number of recordings of Irish jigs and reels and was a source of traditional tunes for many Irish American musicians. By the 1890s, second and third generation Irish Americans wanted to be more American than Irish. The popular music and dances of the period provided a common ground on which they could more closely identify with mainstream culture. While the faithful still gathered to hear traditional music in local pubs, Irish Americans, their children, and their music were becoming Americanized. Tin Pan Alley and vaudeville music written and played by Irish Americans around the turn of the century became popular at the expense of traditional Irish music. Eventually, most Americans mistook songs like McNamara's Band and When Irish Eyes Are Smiling as authentic Irish music. The further Irish Americans drew away from their past, the more romantic and sentimental they became about their ethnic identity. This sentimentality was shared by Americans of many ethnic backgrounds, as was evident in the popularity of St. Patrick's Day celebrations and parades, when it seemed as though almost everybody was a wee bit Irish. Oh, I woke me up this morning and I heard a joyful song from the throats of happy Irishmen, a hundred thousand strong. It was the Hibernian Brigade lining up for the start the big parade. So I grabbed the hat, me father wore upon St. Patrick's Day, and I wore it tilted on the side the good old Irish way. And we all sang the wearing of the green, a finest night I'm sure you've never seen. It's the great day of the Irish, it's the great day for fair. The sidewalks of New York are thick with bloody You'd think that old New York was Kilkenny. It's a great day for the shamrock, for the flags in full array. We're feeling so inspiring because of all the Irish. It's a great, great day. <laughs> Hollywood's motion picture industry was quick to jump on the bandwagon with sentimental portrayals of Ireland featuring popular crooners and entertainers in full-length movies, as well as early predecessors of music videos called Soundies. Something special that they've got to smile about. There are many other two who have sailed the ocean blue. When they see your glory, they can smile and shout. There's nothing like the smile of the iris. You can look into a Colleen's eyes and see. It's their lovely emerald eyes that makes the Irish smile. Oh, there's nothing like the smile of the iris. Most Americans were receptive to Hollywood's sentimental portrayal of Ireland. In fact, many Irish Americans knew little and cared less about the historic struggle for independence in Ireland taking place at that time. This year, in its new constitution, the Free State proclaims all Ireland a sovereign and independent nation, the Republic of Ireland. Father of this newest nation, framer of its constitution, commander-in-chief of its patriotic army, is New York-born Eamon de Valera. Not since Parnell has any leader so completely held the trust of the Irish people as this mathematics professor turned statesman, who, through five years as head of the Free State, 
has worked with a single purpose, to free Ireland from the last traces of British dominance. Even though most of Ireland had achieved independence and millions of Irish Americans were decent citizens, the stereotype of Pat and Mike, the drunken, drawling Irish hooligans, persisted in the United States. Who threw the overalls in Mistress Murphy's powder? It's an Irish trick is true, and I can lick to make that throw. The overalls in Mistress Murphy's powder. Who threw the overalls in Mistress Murphy's powder? After World War II, second and third generation Irish Americans were more concerned about employment than with their ethnic origins. The American ideal of prosperity and comfort came true for many Americans in the late 1950s and early 60s. But it also brought the beginning of a time when young Americans began to question their country's values. The social commentary and protest songs of Pete Seeger and the Weavers, Woody Guthrie and the Kingston Trio were striking a sympathetic chord with American youth. Folk music became part of the popular culture of the time, and with the music, young Americans of many nationalities began to rediscover the Irish living tradition. I was born and raised in Katy, County Armagh, and my mother was a noted folk singer, and uh, she was a source singer. She had hundreds and hundreds of folk songs, and people, collectors came to her from all over the world. My father was a fiddle player, and I had uh, uh, and I had a brother who was an Illum piper and a war piper, and who also played the fiddle, and he taught me to play the whistle and so forth. Um, so I came to America armed with a lot of uh, songs, hundreds and hundreds of folk songs from Ireland. Um, went to New York and uh, met up with Paddy and Tom Clancy. Liam and I had met previously in Ireland. We recorded an album called The Rising of the Moon, uh, which we sang a lot of unaccompanied songs, very good songs. Uh, then about a year later, we got together and we did an album of uh, drinking songs called Confilliard Laugh with us here in New York, uh, never dreaming at the time of becoming singers the folk music boom was really rolling. And here we were with the large repertoire of folk songs that uh, the uh, the folk people had never heard, all fresh new songs. And um, we sang them just uh, very harsh. We sort of blasted them out. And they thought this was a style of singing. By 1965, folk music's skyrocketing popularity brought American folk icon Pete Seeger to national television with his own program, Rainbow Quest. Pete's show featured many of the popular folk musicians of the time, including the internationally acclaimed Clancy Brothers and Tommy Makeup. Uh, I first met the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Makeup, ooh, must be five, ten years ago. Uh, the Clancy's were working as actors down in Greenwich Village, and Tommy had just come over from Ireland and was working in a textile factory up in New Hampshire. 
and come down for the weekend to put on a program of the real old-time Irish music. You know, not the Irish eyes, a smiling variety, but the, the real old stuff. Now the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Macon are known far and wide, not only over the States, but throughout Britain and in their home Ireland. And I thought right now, instead of me yakking about it, I'm going to ask them to sing some songs. And I don't know what you're going to do, but take over. Let's do a little song called uh, the, uh, the Little Beggar Man. <laughs> I am a little beggar man, a beggar may have been nice and sweet for a more than this little light of green. I'm known from the lippy down to the you, and I'm known by the name of a wool gummy do. Of all the trades that's going out, your bacon is the best. Up for when the man is tired, he can sit down and rest. Beg for his dinner, he has nothing else to do. Only cuts around the corner with his old rig to do. They slept in the barn way down at Cordoba on a wet night come on and they slept till the dawn. The fools in the roof and the rain coming through and the rats and the cats they were playing peekaboo. When who should awaken but the woman up the house with her white body apron and her calico blouse. She began to frighten and I said, oh, where is it? Be afraid, ma'am, it's only jolly do. Over the road, let me back, let me back. Over the fields, let me great, let me back. With holes in my shoes, let me toes, feet and blues. Singing, give me a ring if you don't know what I will jolly do. I want to go to bed for a kiss late at night. The fire's all raked and no goes the light. Harry Clancy called me and asked me if I'd like to sing at a, a midnight concert in a theater called the Circle in the Square down in Greenwich Village. Uh, afterwards, um, back in the dressing room, two men came in to see me. Uh, one was, I didn't know who they were at the time. One was Pete Seeger, and the other was Alan Lomax, who's a noted uh, American folk music collector. Uh, and they talked to me about the songs I had sung. And I went out and I got some Pete Seeger records and Weaver records and listened to them. And uh, I was astounded that he was uh, doing, he and they, the Weavers, were doing uh, the same type of songs that I knew very well, folk songs, and they sounded so terrific. And later on, I got myself a banjo. Renewed interest in folk music of all kinds attracted Irish musicians to the American folk circuit playing in coffee houses and small neighborhood pubs, as well as in larger halls. Their contribution to the living tradition helped many Irish Americans rediscover their ethnic identity. The Irish Brigade, featuring Mike Wallace and Jerry Goodwood, perform a song called Coomla in a style popular today in pubs across Ireland and America known as the Trap. Oh, 
Rock music took the stage, and the Irish were caught up in the movement. The first group to gain recognition for adapting Irish music to electronic instruments was Fairport Convention, who were, paradoxically, an English group. Formed around 1969, they performed ballads as well as jigs and reels in a rock context. In 1972, the Irish rock group Horselets released their first record. Another Irish group acted around that time was Planksteen, featuring Donna Looney, Chrissy Moore, and Andy Irvine. They played ballads and traditional songs as well as fiddle tunes. Today, the Pogues from the United Kingdom and American groups, the Drovers and Boiled and Lead, are making their contributions to continuing the living tradition. and we're loud and we're American and we steal from everybody and it kind of turns out even louder than it was before. <laughs> Thank you. 
Irish American cultural organizations are keeping the living tradition of Ireland alive, and they embrace the young people who wish to claim their own part of it. Many of these groups participate in and sponsor Irish festivals like the Milwaukee Irish Fest. These events feature Irish music, dance, crafts, and culture, and are enjoyed by many Americans, regardless of their origins. Irish music is still handed down from older to younger generations, as it always has. Here, Barry Nelson and his sons Don and Chris perform a traditional tune called Bill Hart's Jig. I've been playing music here in the States now for about 15 years, traveling uh, from Vermont down to Texas and New Orleans and far into the Midwest, Minneapolis and Paul, Chicago area. And uh, I like to feel as if I'm passing on uh, this tradition uh, in the history of the, the bards in there. And I've uh, passed it on to my own two sons, uh, Chris and Don, who are also playing the music with me and fiddle and mandolin whistles. And, uh, they also uh, give me a little bit more enthusiasm for playing now too by introducing some new uh, ways of playing music. And uh, I hope to be playing the music for the next 20 years. Ireland has a magnificent heritage of uh, poetry, song, dance, instrumental music, prose. And it's been passed on from generation to generation and kept in good order for hundreds and hundreds of years that has passed into the hands of newer generations as it goes along. We have with us tonight a wonderful group called Cherish the Ladies. They're all uh, young Irish-American uh, ladies who had not only know their heritage inside out, but have a great love for it. And uh, you'll find out whenever they start to play how wonderful they are. One of the old poets sort of summed up the ambience of what Cherish the Ladies are all about. He wrote... A piper in the street today set up and tuned and started to play, and away and away and away on the tide of his music he drifted. On every side, doors and windows were open wide, and men left off their work and came, and women with petticoats colored like flame, and little bare feet that were blue with cold when dancing back to the age of gold, and all the world was gay, was gay, for a half an hour in the street today. Cherish the ladies. Thank you. 
Although Irish music can be heard on stages all across America, the living tradition continues, as it has for centuries, in informal gatherings that the musicians call sessions. impact on the history and music of America, and we've only touched on their contributions here. This documentary is dedicated to the efforts of Irish Americans who have helped to preserve the dynamic, varied, and beautiful living tradition of Irish music. Unwanted, unseen, 
Thank you.